Hi, welcome to Yola National at Home. My name is Emily Bourne and I work uh, in the learning department here at the Los Angeles Philharmonic. Um, I'm joined here by my colleague Angelica Cortez in the learning department and our three wonderful panelists, Carrie Smith, Claire Brezzo, and Cynthia Fuentes. I'll do a little bit more of an introduction in a minute, but just a couple housekeeping things. Uh, Welcome to this panel. Um, if you are viewing on a on the Zoom webinar, feel free to ask questions in the Zoom chat or the Q and A feature. And Angelica here will be moderating the chat. Um, and if you happen to be viewing on YouTube Live, you can also leave your questions in the YouTube chat, and we will be monitoring that as well. Um, so, without further Ado, welcome to this panel. Up your game, self-promotion, branding, and social media for musicians. Uh, we have three amazing panelists, all with very uh, unique perspectives on this topic. Uh, Claire Brazo, the principal oboist in the Los Angeles Chamber Orchestra, and she's also the oboe faculty for the Yola National um, Festival Orchestra. Uh, Cynthia Fuentes, who is a longtime member of the LA Phil, uh, most recently the director of the Ford. Uh, here in LA, and Carrie Smith, who is the Director of Artistic Planning at the Sarasota Orchestra. So welcome to all of you. Um, I think we will kick this off by starting with some introductions. So um, we'll take a couple minutes and maybe each of you can share, uh, you know, your name, where you're from, your background, what you do now, and how, you know, promotion for musicians and social media fits into what you do. So why don't we start with um, let's start with Cynthia. I knew you were going to pick me first. <laughs> well, hi, my name is Cynthia Fuentes. And so as Emily shared, I'm the director of the Ford Theater. I'm from Los Angeles. So I grew up in um, South Central and in Huntington Park areas. Um, I um, have worked for the LFO for about 10 years. And so before taking on the role of director of the Ford Theater, I worked in the marketing department. That's actually what I studied. I studied integrated marketing communications, which is a fancy word of saying, how do you fit social media and press into a business degree? Um, and so at the LA Phil, I worked in promotions, partnerships, and social media. So really thinking about how we were engaging um, with different, not only community groups, but with artists and creating content and helping support um, the advertisement, but also the storytelling for the organization. And so I will pass it to Terry. All right, can you hear me, first of all? Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Uh, so my name is Carrie Smith. I was born in Cincinnati, but really grew up in Minnesota. Um, and I was a violist as a young person, as a very young person. Um, and I pursued a degree in viola performance in college. I went to the University of Wisconsin-Madison and then did a master's um, in Montreal, where actually it's, that's the first time Emily and I met. Um, and I thought I would share a little bit today, not only about how I kind of interface with social media, but also about my job because as a teenager and even, um, uh, in my early 20s, I didn't know that my job exists, and it's really cool. So my job, the title is Director of Artistic Planning, and essentially what you do is you get to work with the music director or the conductor uh, and help them choose repertoire and guest artists for the season and come up with projects, um, and you get to work with marketing, you get to work with uh, fundraisers and, um, and tons of amazing artists, uh, and it's a really important job actually at any orchestra. Um, but I think that, you know, we think of um, the, the front facing, uh, you know, face of, of any orchestra, obviously the musicians and the conductors that come through and the music director. Um, and there are actually a lot of people behind the scenes that are kind of helping put things together. Um, so from that perspective, I uh, typically use social media to get to know new artists, whether they're new to me or young artists, uh, to stay in contact with people um, and to exchange ideas essentially, or to kind of start new relationships and start those conversations. And of course that's in a professional capacity because in my personal life, I'm pretty quiet on social media. Um, but uh, it's, it's a very kind of different side um, of, of 
the performing arts world in that you're kind of looking for the ideas and you're looking for talent and you're looking for interesting things that you can then pass on or kind of work with that person to amplify their voice or create something even bigger. Um, uh, another major part of my career that I'm very proud of was that I worked at the Colburn School and specifically with the Colburn Artist Program. Um, and for many of you who are tuning in who are local to Los Angeles, you know that Colburn is right across the street from Disney Hall. Um, and uh, at Colburn, I got to work with really talented young artists uh, as part of the Colburn Artist Program. And we kind of helped identify young people who could maybe you know, pursue a solo career and basically work with them on the foundational aspects of what that would be, which included headshots and uh, setting up a website. Um, and the interesting thing is, you know, I since left that position, moved on. I'm actually zooming in here from Sarasota, Florida, uh, but social media has become such an important part of the equation. And to be honest, I, you know, as I was reflecting on how I um, look for artists and kind of looked at uh, connecting with people, I find more and more that I'm going to Instagram in particular and Facebook and typically go to websites if I'm interested in like merch or videos, which would then lead me to YouTube or things like that. But even Instagram TV, IGTV is kind of taking over. Uh, so I'll speak more to that later on and pass it off to uh, Claire, who is also a very talented Colburn alumni. And thank you, Emily, so much for having me on. Thanks, Carrie. Um, so I am from Escanaba, Michigan. It's a very small town in Northern Michigan. I am now a professional oboist in Los Angeles. I play in the Los Angeles Chamber Orchestra. I'm a proud member of the faculty at Yola National. I teach on faculty at the California State University in Long Beach. And I also do a lot of freelance work, uh, recording work in the studios for film and television. Uh, but I'm here today to talk about how in the last four years, I've really taken to my Instagram page. And it started out, I was kind of getting to know the platform and I started uh, searching the hashtags. I started searching hashtag oboe, like what's out there? And it was a bunch of flutists and violinists hashtagging oboe. And it really made me angry that <laughs> there, the oboe was not getting represented. So that was why I first started thinking like, okay, you know, we could do this too. I know we're underappreciated, underrepresented, but uh, I've got all these materials from concert footage. And so I just started sharing. And over the years, it's really picked up. I have almost 12,000 followers now. And it's very targeted towards uh, the oboe community. A lot of young oboists, a lot of student age demographics. And I feel like it's it's grown very organically. A lot of people ask me, do you have people, you have a team helping you with it? Are you paying for ads? It's like, no, <laughs> it's just, happened very organically, a lot of engagement. I feel like it's helped me connect with the oboe community. I've learned a lot about the oboe community and the oboe community's learned a lot about me. Um, and very recently, since the pandemic happened, I have founded a an international oboe competition all online. And my platform on Instagram has really helped me get the word out with that. So that's been an, a really great thing that I'm very excited about that I don't think would have happened without the the exposure I've gotten on Instagram. So. Great. Thank you all so much for that. I think, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind for me is just hearing from these different folks with really different angles on which um, if you for those of you who are young musicians on this call, um, these are all the different kinds of people that are looking at your content online. And then there's another angle too, where these are all ways that if you're interested in this kind of thing, um, there, there are career pathways too that involve working on this stuff that, that aren't just sort of being an artist. I think there's kind of multiple channels and, and, and pathways that involve this stuff. And, and it is so important, um, especially now more than ever where there's just so much going on online. Um, 
So I want to ask you all a little bit about your thoughts on um, sort of storytelling and how young musicians can use social media as a way to share with others sort of who they are, what they believe in, what are their values, how, who are you as an artist, um, more than just, you know, here's what I can do on the violin or here's what I can do on the trumpet or whatever it is, right? So curious uh, about what you guys think about that question. Should I go first since I unmuted first? first. Okay. <laughs> Um, so I love the idea of, of kind of thinking of social media as storytelling because I think it speaks a lot to the kind of depth that you can actually get um, when you're strategic about what you're trying to say and what you're trying to do. Um, uh, Emily shared with us that, you know, um, the festival is kind of exploring some of these questions, including like, who are you? And it's such a vast, wide, kind of scary question. Um, and one thing, you know, in terms of artists, I do think it is really important to show, yes, I can play, I can play this concerto to share what you can actually kind of technically artistically do, um, to, to share music that means something to you, to share things that you're proud of that's really important. Um, but I think it's also important to show your taste. And what I mean by that is just very simply things that you like. So if you go to a concert and you really enjoyed it, if you are, if your friend is doing something that you're really proud of, or you think is really cool, reposting it, which of course is always good too, to strengthen your bonds. Um, but essentially being able to express what you like and why is, is actually pretty rare and very important in the artistic world. And I think it's a great way of starting to sort of chip away at who am I? What am I about? Those sort of things. Um, yeah, and I would pass it off to either Cynthia or Claire if they wanted to chime in. I can chime in. Um, uh -huh. I think that one of the things that's really, you know, and where I, I do see um, how this is very similar to the way that marketers think about that and the way that they think about brands, right? So like a lot of times we have conversations about like, what's the voice? You know, like, so what's the voice of your brand? And I would say like from a personal perspective, it's also like, what's your voice? What are you trying to amplify? And so having um, young folks kind of do an inventory, you know, like social media is very public, right? Especially if your accounts are, pri are, are kind of open to the public and say like, what does my social media say about me? You know, and I, and I had a couple of my friends kind of do this exercise with me to say like, you know, like let's take the last 20 things that you posted on social like, how does that represent who you are, right? Like, are you someone that like likes going to concerts? Are you somebody who really loves, you know, I have a friend who who really loves knitting. And so she posts a lot of things about herself knitting, right? And so like, kind of that then helps you identify like, what are those unique things that you bring to the table? Um, and I love what Clara said. Like, I think that um, also like taking an assessment of like what is out there in the world um, like what is the, what's the need that needs to be filled, right? And so like, there's so many kind of food accounts, right? Like there's so many Instagrams that are focused on food. Um, but like, if I'm somebody who likes this very particular type of music or this have a very particular hobby and there's not, a, there's not like a big community, is there a, is there a, something that you can fill in as we think about your social media? Um, and the storytelling that you are doing with it. And again, like I do agree with you, like I always say like social media is a story, right? And so like, what's the story that you're trying to put out in the internet and in the world with your content and how are you then kind of filling that story up? Hi, I love that, Cynthia. Um, and I just wanted to add that if you are just getting going on thinking about how social media can intersect with your musicality, with your music career, or, you know, what, what, how to use it as a tool that I think it's important to feel that you, it can be another creative outlet. Like you can experiment, you can figure out what your values are through this. It can be this tool to help you hone in on what, kind of image you want to put forth? What kind of an artist am I? Who, who is my audience? You don't have to know that exactly going in, but it's great to 
as you go along to keep reviewing what what you're putting out there and see if there are consistencies and yeah that's my point for now I love that <laughs> yeah I love that idea Cynthia of kind of taking almost like an audit of of what you've had there almost maybe even as a discovery of figuring out you might actually learn something from that that you you wouldn't have realized if you hadn't have kind of done that which I think is really cool I why don't we stick on this idea of um starting out um and it kind of leads to one of the questions that somebody had asked when they when they registered for this event. Um, so, okay, two pronged question. Like, what are some additional um, thoughts to consider if you're just sort of starting out as you know, really you know, putting your foot forward as an artist on social media? And then the second part of that question, and this is something that came in a, a couple different times, was. Um, how are you differentiating from your personal shares and your professional shares? Should you have two different accounts? When do you break off? Should you break off at all? Um, that question comes up a lot. So, so yeah, questions about that. Um, maybe Claire, I'm, I'm curious to start with you. All right. Um, starting out, it's, it's, it's a big task to take on a little bit because it's like, anything goes on Instagram, really. Um, you see what, what works for you. It's very experimental. I would say to keep in mind, though, with each platform that you're using, there's a different audience. And I think we all know that on Instagram, we're scroll happy and we're, we have the attention span of fruit flies. So you don't necessarily want to post your two-hour band concert, right? That's not maybe YouTube for that. Maybe that would be where longer videos are more acceptable. Um, but for an Instagram, you want it to be eye catching right at the beginning. If it's a video or if it's a photo, um, I think quality over, uh, quantity is definitely an important thing to keep in mind. Um, what was the second question? Second question was about uh, differentiating personal posts from professional posts and if there should be a difference. And I know there's a lot of different opinions on that. So I'm curious what you guys think about that. Yeah, I, I have mixed feelings about it for sure. Um, I've found I'm more comfortable keeping things fairly professional. But that said, I have shown my more goofy side. I, I have uploaded TikTok videos making fun of what it means to be an oboist. Right? Um, I'm happy to share that part of me. But um, in terms of more personal information, I, I, I keep for a separate area of my life. Um, but I, it's, it's personal. I think you want to make sure that if it's a public account that you feel comfortable with a teacher viewing it or someone who might someday hire you any of your colleagues might someday hire you to, so to keep that, you know, pr goal of being, putting your best foot forward, I think is important while also adding depth and sharing who you are. It's, it's a, it's a balance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would just, I would agree with that, you know, and I, and I think that there's, you know, like I keep my personal accounts private and then there's like certain brands, of course, because I oversaw some of the social for, for the field before, like I was, you know, like kind of overseeing those and also understanding like there could be a potential for two different voices and points of view, right? And so to say like, this is like my personal. And so like from a branding perspective or like as you're developing like almost like a persona, um, it's like, what is, what is the content for the sake of keeping consistency? You know, and I think that that's, the one thing about building, um, you know, like when you, as you're building an account for yourself professionally, it's like keeping the consistency of the content that you're putting out there um, in order to like be able to gauge followers, right? And so like people know what to expect when they're coming to that particular page or they know who you are in that sense. Um, so. Nice. Um, so interesting to hear you guys comment on this because I all I mean I think I just from observing I've seen it done many ways 
and one thing at Colburn, um, there was often sort of an opportune time for uh, a Colburn artist to take the step and, and do a professional page, especially on Facebook. And that was usually after they either won a competition or there was some kind of large milestone. And then we would say, okay, and now you create the professional page. And it's interesting because I think the value of that on Facebook specifically is that you have like the, you have the website connection. So there's like sort of the easy and clear link um, it is very professional. And then you have the calendaring. So all of your events coming up are clearly there. Um, that being said, I feel like I've observed a lot of more mature artists, like particularly soloists and conductors who are joining Instagram. And it's kind of like anything goes, kind of as we've been describing, like it's such a fusion. So sometimes you'll see they'll post like um, essentially a, a recital or something Instagram TV worthy. And then the next post will be about their grandchildren or something like that. So, um, you know, always like uh, professional and appropriate, but still very much like this is, it's suddenly you have this view into their world uh, that's really nice and make kind of makes you feel like you know them on a more personal level, which I actually really enjoy even in a professional setting, it's really nice. Um, but yeah, I think it's really difficult on Instagram in particular, which is so much about sort of kind of adding your personal flair and your like color of your life to everything that you can offer professionally to sort of keep them so starkly separate. Yeah, that's super interesting. I want to I wanna move on maybe to this idea, and again, this is something that we got quite a few questions about, like, what about getting gigs, like using your online profile, like in an entrepreneurial way, whether that means, you know, getting gigs or finding other, I mean, I guess there's different prompts to that, right? Like there's, there's the aspect of getting gigs. And then there's also the aspect in social media, if you're um, gaining some amount of popularity, there's, you know, other sources of income that come in that come into play but um, maybe let's just start with the, with this idea of sort of getting gigs and promoting yourself you know within communities where you otherwise would be getting those gigs and you know from another channel so I'm curious about that from you guys I guess I'll see. okay <laughs> sorry I should call on you guys Awkward that's calls. all right um I would say I wouldn't go into it and I didn't go into it thinking, oh, I'm going to get a bunch of gigs out of this because mm -hmm. I don't I don't think that happens really. Um, I think there's other opportunities that come from it, certainly that can come from it. And also the value of having this space where you can curate exactly how you want to be heard. You can play what you want to play, wear what you want to wear. You are, you know, say what you want to say. You are creating yourself here, like a website, like, a, you know, any of the, it's just that you have full control over what kind of artist you want to be putting forth to the world. So I think there's a lot of value in that. Um, I, I kind of got into it with the sense that I could connect with a lot of student age uh, a crowd. Um, and that has definitely helped. I have gotten teaching opportunities out of it, certainly. Um, that, but that's just my specific case. I know, I know there's definitely musicians out there that are getting promotional sponsorship. You know, there's, there's, there are options out there. I just, I wouldn't go into it for those reasons. I think it's, it's more personal than that. That's great advice. Carrie? Yeah, I, I think I would absolutely agree with Claire um, in that as of right now, and obviously the, wor the world can and will change, but as of right now, um, I wouldn't really use uh, Instagram or Facebook or any kind of online resource as an like audition page. Um, even, even hearing a recital or something, it's still um, crucial for me, from my perspective, to hear someone in person if I can, or just like very extensively, especially if we're talking about a younger artist. Um, this is like such a womp womp thing to say, but I, I will caution that there are some things that one 
could post on social media, which would make me nervous about hiring someone, um, which is kind of what Claire was mentioning before, like keep in mind that you could be um, getting hired by anyone essentially. But I think one thing that's a major asset for me and is often like a light bulb or click moment is when I see people, especially young people posting and kind of showing who they like to play chamber music with, um, who they who they have like friendships or uh, artistic relationships with, what conductors they have already played with, things like that really help me. So if I'm already looking to book someone and I know, oh, they have this relationship and we're trying to slot something in for blah, 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 then suddenly it's like, why don't we pair them together? Why don't we do this? It's like, um, it's absolutely like a canvas where you're uh, painting and like kind of creating uh, ideas that only help me so we can kind of make something bigger. Um, so I, I think it can be really helpful to put those things on display and then that then helps someone like me to like actually get you on stage. And I think I'm going to, I'm going to date myself by saying this, but there was a movie in the nineties that was called Field of Dreams. And they said like, if you build it, they will come. Right. And so I think that, um, that's kind of with social media, right? So you can't go into it and be like, I'm going to make, I'm going to get all these gigs. And I just started the account. It's about like staying true to who you are, building, building something that you're really proud of. And that comes through. And I think that like everybody goes back to like, it's the authenticity of what you're putting out. Um, and so if, if it's authentic and you're having fun, if it's unique, then like by itself, it kind of helps create, um, an organic an organic and I would say like Claire is a perfect example of that right and so like um, she created this very organic brand to herself and she, and she didn't go into it thinking like I'm going to make money you know and so I think that those things will come naturally if you kind of go through the motions of of building you know like the building um, whatever the persona or the brand that you're trying to um, put out. Um, and I think the other thing, you know, social is interesting because it is like you're your own producer, you're your own editor, and you, you can kind of select the content that you put out. Um, and so like it also gives you the ability to be really flexible. And so I think that, you know, once you like work for a larger organization or you, over, you know, there's so many rules that you have to follow. And so I think that when you're doing it for yourself, there is such an opportunity to be very creative and to really jump into technology or, you know, like things that come up real fast, you know? And so I would say like TikTok is a perfect example. Like if you're able to gravitate to a new platform and like kind of utilize it for its full potential, it can actually get you a lot of followers and have you be ahead of the game really early on versus like people who have to kind of sit down and think like, well, how does this fit into my media mix? And like, what's the best approach to how to dive into it? Like, just go in there, have fun, you know, and, and I think that that will naturally then kind of lead into something in the future. Very cool. I, I have a question about, um, you know, what you're saying about, you know, different platforms, Cynthia, I think leads to this too. Um, when we're, if we're talking about, I mean, we're talking about social media, we're also just sort of talking about self-promotion online in general. And I want to take a minute to talk about like, what do you use? And maybe we can just like really break this down for everybody on the call. Like, what do you use Instagram for? What do you, when should you have a website? What should you, should you have a LinkedIn? Should you, you know, all these different platforms, like, what are our feelings on, um, you know, for young musicians and maybe for the purpose of this, let's focus on the, you know, the Yola National Festival musicians or their peers, you know, folks who are, uh, you know, in high school, maybe want to go study music in college. Like, when do you need a website? When do you, do you need a LinkedIn? When do you use Instagram, Facebook, whatever? Um, maybe Claire, do you want to, do you want to start? Do people still use LinkedIn? I don't know. Maybe I just like completely dated myself. Thing, but I have a LinkedIn. <laughs> you, um, hard pass. <laughs> hard pass, Emily. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, I, I didn't get my own website until I was almost done with school. And that felt comfortable. I think it, it takes a... 
Yeah. I I don't know. I'm I'm open. I, I I also I think things are changing. I think so much is more readily accessible online now. So maybe it's more important to have a, a website the younger you are now. Um, but certainly to have, you know, if you are active on social media, I think it's important to show that if you are passionate about music, about your art, that you want to start sharing that somewhere. And to show that, you know, if somebody Googles your name, do you want them to find you playing your flute, playing, you know, what the, your choice of music, right? You have control over what people can find. Um, so it's, I think it's about your values. Do you, do, do you want to have that out there and, and when to start doing that? But I would definitely say if, if you're inclined to, you know, get, get a good recording of yourself and get it out there. There's... And also, if you're afraid to get a, a recording out there, as I know, I, I understand the feeling, <laughs> certainly, of getting out a recording of yourself and you're, you're thinking, I, you know, I, it's not perfect. It's not, you know, I, I, there's all these insecurities that we as perfectionist musicians deal with. Um, I would say, yes, quality is very important and, you know, learn how to record yourself well, right? Learn how far away you need to have your microphone or your cell phone. I just, I did, I was, my home recordings on my Instagram were all on an iPad until three months ago. Uh, so I, I haven't spent thousands of dollars on fancy equipment. Um, where was I going with that? Um, I would say that you can allow yourself to grow too, right? There are recordings of myself from years ago that I may have taken down now because I know I'm a different, I've, I've grown into a different artist since then. So you, again, you have control over it. And I, I think it's important to, to, you know, to get your best foot out there. Mm -hmm. I want to, sorry, before we hear from Cynthia and Carrie, I want to add a caveat too. In terms of this question, you know, we have um, musicians at, at a lot of different ages. So I think something to pay attention to as well is, you know, if you're a younger musician and you're, you know, still in high school, you know, think about privacy too and 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 have these conversations with your teachers and your parents too about like what's the right amount of exposure for you at that time. Um, you know, the same with like prepping for college and all these things, it's never too early to start thinking about these things. And like Claire is saying, you know, think about the way you're recording yourself and start recording yourself and understanding these things. But again, you know, I, you know, for everyone on the call, I just want to add that caveat that, you know, those are, these are also things to consider. And, and uh, so you probably don't need a LinkedIn. That's <laughs> my self-reflection here. Anyway, so <laughs> continue, <laughs> Cynthia. <laughs> I mean, I would say website, social, I would say both, you know, and I think just like from the, from the standpoint of somebody who is constantly online looking for information about artists, it's helpful to have a website. And so, you know, I always say like, if somebody was going to read three sentences about who you are, what would those three sentences say, right? And so I would say like, have a long bi a bio or a place that houses kind of historic information about you. And then like, kind of the short version of that for someone um, who was looking for information about you professionally. But, you know, I was looking at demographic information, just research info about um, how platforms are used. And I think that that's a really good way for people to utilize or to do the research, right? So like, what are these social media platforms used for? And so like, you can see like, you know, some of them are for video or people use them to purchase products. And so 81% of people that um, used Instagrams basically said that they use it to research a product or an artist, right? And so like, if I want to hear something from an up and coming brand, it's likely that I'm going to go to their Instagram first, right? And so like making sure that you're going to the link in bio. And so where is that link in bio leading to? Is it going to your website? Is it going to, um, you know, to like another platform that gives a little bit more info, I think is good. And I would say YouTube is also a super, you know, like utilizing YouTube to tag your videos is really important. And so that it houses kind of the history, as Claire was saying, like the history of how you've evolved as a musician. Um, but it does kind of bring up your name when you search it, right? So if you keep tagging your name over and over, 
um, if somebody just does a Google search, like it's likely that one of those videos will come up. And so like, um, it's a really un unfancy version or like not so um, fun version of social media, but like really relying on the metrics. And so being able to like do the research of like what, like what makes sense for this particular platform? How do marketers use it? How do consumers use it? Um, because then that just helps you uh, know where to put your material out. Can I jump in there on that? Just as an example, I've learned that if I put a picture up without an oboe, nobody pays attention. <laughs> right. So if I <laughs> so if I want to put something a very important announcement up, it has to be with an oboe in it. <laughs> it's just a little example. <laughs> That's so wild. I love um, Cynthia when you talk about metrics, both both you and Claire, because. Uh, to me, I always think that like data equals truth. Um, and that's one thing in terms of social media that we have a lot of control over. Um, and, and that idea of how we control some of these uh, social platforms came to mind when Emily mentioned that for some of our younger viewers. Um, but one thing that's really great in this in the year 2020 is that on YouTube and on Instagram, you do have a lot of control over who can comment, how people interface with you, how you can, you know, go back and forth with them. Um, and I think in a lot of ways, it's a positive, especially for a young artist who's kind of getting started, trying to put things out there. And um, it, it creates a way for you to kind of have a safe space um, on the internet. I also think, you know, especially if you're a young person in high school and you maybe don't have a lot of concerts coming up or you're not, you know, you wouldn't necessarily have tons of new things to post on a website. Having YouTube and having some content to put on a website thus creates a reason to have one. Um, so I think that is uh, just a, a fantastic reason on its own uh, to create one. Um, in terms of Facebook, Facebook is kind of, interesting to me because I, I personally don't feel like I'm a master of it. Um, I'm really curious as to Cynthia and Claire, how you feel like it's best to use, but um, you know, with Facebook, people can write on your wall, they can tag you. To me, it feels like someone could put something silly on your Facebook wall, um, you know, even with privacy settings. And then suddenly it's kind of, it's kind of become something else. Whereas with Instagram, you don't have that. It's always kind of your grid and your stories, although you can repost people's. But to me, a Facebook uh, is, is a little clunkier. And I'd be curious to, to hear what you would like say to younger people because it's something I've struggled with. I don't do Facebook as much as I do on Instagram. I'm less active on Facebook. I, and I'm more personal on Facebook too. I, I make sure that it's it's a bit more. That's where family and friends are. I have a professional Facebook page, and it just I don't know. It, <laughs> it hasn't I haven't been as active on it. I don't have a good reason for that. So I would say that it kind of goes back to like um, diving into a platform when it first come out. When it first comes out. Um, when first book first started I think that there was like a lot of things about it that people gravitated to right and so like I don't use Facebook as much as well and I think that part of it is that it's it's not organic anymore and so Facebook has kind of really become a tool for like advertisers um, so it's actually really hard for people to be able to see your content on Facebook but I think what works in Facebook really well are the events and so like, you know, if you put something, you know, like if you are going to do a gig or are doing an, a live of some sort, I would say like creating a Facebook event is always helpful because you can utilize it to like um, to invite people to attend and it gives them a reminder. I think that Facebook Live is also still very interesting. You know, I know YouTube is also great, but it does give you the opportunity to engage with people in the moment. So there's certainly things that Facebook can still do very well. Um, but I would say that it kind of has passed the prime in the sense of being a tool that's organic. And I would say like Instagram will head in that direction in a couple years. Like even now, it's something that's really monetized. Sorry, that's my dog. Um, that's um, that 
that is going to be monetized, right? And so I think TikTok right now is the opportunity for folks. Like TikTok is really kind of the fastest growing, growing platform. Um, and we're, there's an opportunity for a lot of um, engagement, I think. So, yeah, I don't want to say that Facebook is gone, but it's on its way in, in this sense of like the organic sense. Thank you. So we have about 15 minutes left. Um, do How do we want to do this? Do we want to go into Q&A now or are there any final thoughts you want to offer before we do that? I do want to add one thing about, um, you know, like just building your networks and collaborations. You know, I think that, um, and I mentioned this earlier in, a, in another conversation, but um, I read an interview with Issa Rae, um, who wrote Insecure a couple years ago. And what she said is like, build your own networks, right? And so like, don't wait to be invited to be part of a big um, kind of collaboration. Like if you have friends and you have an idea, move it forward. Like build that, you know, like build connections across the country, which I think that's the flexibility of social media, right? That it doesn't have to be your neighbor or the person you go to school with. Like you can reach out to somebody on their DM and of course, of course being safe about it, but um, kind of making those connections with people that are like-minded. And so then you can build kind of these clusters and these communities. And I think that that's something that I think is really important, thinking about who are some of the other accounts or other you know, other people doing, you know, have who have similar interests that you can create content with, because I think that that's also a way to build your platforms. And then I would say the second thing is jump on an opportunity um, when it presents itself. And I would say that my introduction to Claire was actually she created a video for Game of Thrones. At the <laughs> and so I was completely obsessed with it. Right. And so like she just jumped on this opportunity and it was very timely. <laughs> super well done and also like I shared it with you know so I think that don't be afraid to do those kinds of things you know because I think that they will pay off at the end that's awesome so uh folks on the call feel free to keep using the chat feature in Q&A to uh, ask questions I have one question here um to start with from Amy um, what do you think about musician practice accounts to showcase, showcase how someone practices, like a behind the scenes type of Instagram? Um, how would you get discovered by more people uh, using that tactic? So I guess two part question. What do you think about, you know, showcasing practice, like the 100 days of practice hashtag? Maybe Claire, you want to jump in? I was hoping we would talk about this because I have mixed feelings about it. I really do. Because um, it was Hillary Hahn that started it, right? And on the I one hand, so. she's Hillary, right? Yeah, I think, I think so. so. Hillary Hahn? Yeah, Hillary Hahn's her violin case, right? Her violin case account. Um, on the one hand, it's Hillary Hahn, right? She's already built up her stardom, Right. We can see and everybody's really interested to hear her vulnerabilities, to hear her work ethic, to hear how she works through a piece where if I'm 16 year old Claire practicing, struggling through my etudes, it's not quite the same. Um, but on the other hand, it also shows dedication. She says she'd be practicing for 100 days straight and sharing it. That's I think that's a huge accomplishment. So I really do have mixed feelings about it. I I don't post practice accounts, uh, practice sessions, because I want to always put my most professional sound forward. That, you know, I don't always sound as good as I sound on my videos, <laughs> but I, that's what I'm selling. That's my product. That's what I can do. And that's what I want to show to the world. There's also the fact that once you put it out there, anybody can take that audio or that video and do anything with it out of context. So they can say, this is clear, you know, like if I was just practicing them, they would take it out and not say that it's a practice video, right? And so all of a sudden there's someone who's gonna hire me who's gonna go, <laughs> not really nailing it. <laughs> um, that said, there's a bassoonist student, I think she's at Juilliard, Morgan practices bassoon. 
and she has 28,000 followers and it's a practice account and she's doing it really well. She was mentioned, she had an article in the New Yorker about this tactic of, of practice accounts and she's, she's doing it very well though. Um, she, she opens it up into educational moments, right? So it has that educational component. It's not just here is my practice session, right? She's, and she also has, she, she loves Stravinsky. She goes into educational moments about Stravinsky every week. Like, so there, I think there's a way to do it and there's a wrong way to do it. That's, that's how I feel. I, um, I would say I have never clicked on a practice video. I mean, I, I, just to be totally honest, there's no way I'm interested in that. Um, and uh, not, not because I'm not interested in the person, but basically because of what Claire uh, put out there. I really want to see someone doing their best. Um, so those videos, I stay away from. I will say in terms of kind of like cutesy, gimmicky Instagram things, I've noticed that um, some people, I, I don't know if this came from like two set violin, but some people are starting to to do videos where they they like superimpose two different versions of themselves because there's like the acapella app where you can actually like like I can do Mendelssohn octet and play every single part and then there there are people who have the um, like the technology savvy to actually like put themselves into a frame like two versions of themselves and things like that I will listen to for um, five to ten seconds uh, but in terms of um, you know like really getting a gig, even, you know, like a personnel manager at an orchestra, I don't think they would like tune into practice videos or videos like that. Um, I think probably, I haven't heard of this bassoon account, but I'm very curious. And I think it'll be the first thing I do once they get off this panel, um, because I can't imagine people being like, oh, bassoon practice. But, you know, obviously I'm really <laughs> excited to know about this. Um, but what she's obviously created is a connection and a conversation. Um, and that's ultimately the goal. One thing that comes to mind for me with that is, I think there are, if, if what was interesting about, you know, Hillary Hahn posting this hashtag 100 days of practice and showcasing herself practicing, like Claire was saying, she's a professional. A lot of people know and love her and have for a really long time. Um, they're interested in process, right? It's process over product. And, and so if what you're trying to get at is highlighting your process as learning as a musician, there's ways to do that. Um, that might actually be more interesting to your followers might be a little bit you know, I don't know, maybe more human or true to who you are. And there's, so there's, there's ways. And I think you can do that through storytelling. You can, I think there's ways to show your process and still put your best foot forward. So something to think about in that way too, that maybe it's about storytelling. Maybe you're talking, maybe it's, you know, a, a photo of yourself with your instrument. And then the text is a story about an audition that maybe like didn't go so well or something like that, where you're sort of displaying growth and process without putting something out there that somebody might do something with or have an opinion about that that you didn't necessarily want them to have right so giving the message that you really want to want to offer as opposed to you know kind of um yeah like you say struggling through etudes or whatever it is right yeah um any other thoughts or well here let's move on to another question because we're getting close to the end of the session um Let's see, there's a few good ones. Um, Claire, are you interested in sharing some specifics about equipment that you use to sound your best on social media? Okay. <laughs> I Yeah, like Is I said, it, it wasn't until March that I, I got this bad boy. <laughs> Um, it's a tube condenser, Mike, I can share you the specific, share with you the specifics over Instagram if you want to know. But, uh, I also think there's a lot of power in spending some time, a lot of value in spending some time learning and editing program, right? Cause we're, we're all in our bedrooms. We're all in these small spaces. We are not in concert halls and we want to sound more like we sound in a concert hall. So there is, 
uh, a lot you can teach yourself, a lot of videos you can watch on YouTube or talk to a friend who's really into it. There's free audio editing programs. There's, there's tutorials for everything out there. It's just, it's time consuming to, to learn, learn your way around it, but I, I think it's well worth it. Um, and since I've been in lockdown, I've been getting a lot more work uh, to do recording, remote recording work from home. So I've had to really dive into that. So I'm happy to help if anybody <laughs> needs guidance on that. Cool, thank you. Okay, so time for one final question. And I think this is probably a good one for you, Cynthia and Carrie. It's a little bit more of a question on um, education groups and institutions. So. Samuel is saying, as a music education major, I often find that school music programs will fail to truly catch the attention of the general public. Uh, in this regard, what are some keys that music programs and schools should keep in mind when it comes to social media? Should we aim to tell more stories or showcase talent? Um, do we bring attention to the students individually or to the ensemble? Um, and should our goal be to build our student social media presence? So, okay, there's a lot to unpack in that question, but I guess generally like from schools or institutions, like, um, you know, what what should, what, what would you wanna see more of or less of from those groups? I'll jump in because I have a lot of opinions about this. Um, and I would say that I do wish that organizations were a little bit more flexible when it comes to their social, you know, and, and I, and I think that, um, you know, and part of it, it ha has a lot to do because it's a brand, but I think that there is an opportunity for storytelling that's really important. And I think that one of the things that I was really lucky to do is actually go to Mexico City with Yola last year, um, because I think that it's important to ensure that you're utilizing the platform to tell the story. And so I would always say to my team, if it's not on Instagram, it didn't happen. Like, right. So like we can have a concert and it can be amazing. And there was 2000 people sitting in their seats and they had the most fabulous time. And that's it. Like, whereas is if you put it on social and you really kind of bring the audience into, into it and with display, whether it's, um, backstage or the process or follow a student, then you're inviting them to be part of the story in a way that we can't do if we essentially just don't put it out, you know? And so I think that like, so it has been really flexible and like really trying to dive into that space in that way, you know? And, and I think that, you know, and I, it kind of goes back to the um, organizations being a little bit more flexible with their social. And I understand why there is such a concern because it is something so public. Right. So it's our it's our way of of essentially being your own press company, you know, and so like then I think that there's good things that come with that and there's bad things that come with that. But I think that there's definitely room for organizations to really lean into it in a much more successful way. Yeah, I it's such an interesting question. And um, of course, like just even hearing the question, it seems like, yes, yeah, yeah, everything, all of it, do it. And I'm sure that with schools, there's some like very specific constraints in terms of how they can, you know, put students online and um, and showcase them. But I think it also, I mean, this question, it seems to me kind of goes back to um, what we were saying before in terms of, you know, telling a very specific story, what is sort of the end goal? And, and if it's like, you know, you're in an area where you're fighting for funding or you're um, uh, essentially you're, you're fighting between, um, or not fighting, I shouldn't put it that way, but, but your ensemble deserves recognition and hasn't necessarily gotten that kind of recognition in the district. Um, I think what an excellent way, like what an excellent vehicle of just naturally putting it out there of showcasing your ensemble. Um, and, I think that in terms of uh, specific students, if that gets murky, then the ensemble itself is enough. But kind of what Cynthia was mentioning, if it's not out there, then it didn't happen. So regular, um, regular posts and uh, really a variety of things could really help the whole situation, I would hope. I know that's not super helpful, but from my perspective, uh, uh, a, a page like that could be a major game changer. Thank you. 
Okay, we are uh, pretty much out of time. Thank you all so much. Um, I guess if folks want to get in touch with you, um, I wonder if maybe you guys can leave in the chat the best way to, if, if folks want to get in touch, um, whether it's Instagram or um, email. I know Claire's is, um, yeah, there we go, at Obo Jones. Um, any final, final thoughts on this? One, one final takeaway you'd want people to know about social media and self-promotion? What Claire said, um, learn how to use the editing tools, you know, and I just go back to like, you can then control the narrative, you can tell your own stories and, and don't be afraid of social. Love it. Um, well, I would add thanks to Cynthia and Claire, who are both awesome. And I feel like I have, I will be able to up my game just based on <laughs> this panel benefiting from it. Awesome. awesome. Thanks so much for having us. And yeah, if there's any specifics that I can help with anybody from this, I'm happy to. Great. Okay, thanks, thanks so Emily. much, you guys. And thanks everybody for tuning in to Yola and Ashla at Home. We have one more session actually that starts in about 30 minutes, uh, a teaching insight session on uh, how to le lead inspiring rehearsals. So if you're uh, in it to win it with Yola National today, you can tune in again in 30 minutes for that. But otherwise, thank you so much. Uh, have a great day, everybody. Bye.